This episode is brought to you by REN. Alternative fuels like methanol, ammonia, and hydrogen are being explored to help reduce carbon emissions from the shipping industry. But is it enough? At the United Nations Climate Change Conference, often called COP26 this past year, nuclear power was brought up as a promising solution when it comes to fuel cost and performance. With countries like the US, China, and South Korea developing molten salt reactors, as well as small modular reactors for ships, submarines, and offshore power plants, could nuclear energy be the answer? Let's explore nuclear power for shipping and when, or if, it can be the future of shipping. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Renewable solutions for energy storage, electric vehicles, and sustainable homes are centerpieces to drive our world towards net zero. However, achieving a carbon-free future will also require decarbonization of industries that may not have as much of a significant share in carbon emissions, like shipping. Today, shipping accounts for about 2.5% of global CO2 emissions. And although this figure looks kind of low, it corresponds to 940 million tons every year. So in order to pull that down, several alternatives have been proposed like biofuels, hydrogen, ammonia, and even wind propulsion that I explored in a previous video. Last year at COP26, world leaders met in Glasgow, UK to discuss measures to solve the climate crisis. US climate envoy John Kerry mentioned that nuclear propulsion could be a great alternative to decarbonize shipping and achieve net zero by 2050. Now, even though nuclear power has a stigma around it due to the past disasters and challenges with managing nuclear waste disposal, innovations like small modular reactors and molten salt reactors have been changing the way we see nuclear power when it comes to cost, safety, and sustainability. Nuclear could be the power source to produce green hydrogen and ammonia, or even be the main fuel for propulsion and shipping. And some companies around the globe are planning to do just that. But before we dive into the recent news around these technologies, it's good to put them in context. Like several other technologies, nuclear power for marine propulsion really spawned from war. Increasing conflicts between the US and the Soviet Union inspired the US to build stronger military assets. In July of 1951, Congress approved the development of a nuclear propulsion plan in which Captain Hyman G. Rickover headed the Naval Reactors Branch of the Atomic Energy Commission to develop a nuclear-powered submarine. Four years later, a nuclear propulsion reactor was used in the US Nautilus submarine, which was able to sail 10 times longer than any previous submarine and two times faster than most submarines during World War II. By 1962, the US Navy had 30 of these submarines under construction and 26 already operational. Nuclear propulsion was also developed in England, France, Russia, and China. Germany also employed nuclear power for shipping, developing the Otto Hahn, a nuclear-powered cargo vessel that was launched in 1964. It was deactivated in 1979 in favor of diesel engines. One of the main reasons for that shift to diesel was because of issues around liability and nuclear waste storage. Fossil fuels proved to be cheaper and less hassle for commercial operations. However, with the increasing need for cleaner technologies, nuclear propulsion is back on the radar for companies and governments. Just like any conventional nuclear power plant, powering ships and submarines with nuclear energy depends on nuclear fission. Just a quick refresher, nuclear fission is a process where materials are bombarded with neutrons, which split atoms and release energy. When the atoms split, additional neutrons are generated hitting other atoms, feeding a chain reaction. The energy is then used to heat water, turning it into steam, and the steam is used to turn turbines to generate electricity. It's oversimplified, but that's basically how it works. The most common type of nuclear reactor for marine applications is a pressurized water reactor. In these systems, the heat produced from the chain reaction is used by the primary water circuit, which feeds a steam generator at temperatures around 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. It's about 482 to 572 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam is used to drive a turbine's generator, which powers the propeller to make the ship move forward. After that, the steam is cooled, condensed, and transferred back to the steam generator via the pumps. Any energy surplus not used in the propulsion is stored in batteries to provide power for all the electric needs on board, as well as for emergencies. There are several benefits to using nuclear power for marine propulsion beyond just reducing CO2 emissions. But before I get to the benefits of that, I'd like to talk about another way each one of us as individuals can help reduce our own CO2 impact on the environment. We all have varying carbon footprints just from living our lives. And today's sponsor, REN, can help you calculate yours by answering a few simple questions and then showing you ways to reduce and offset it. You can also sign up for a monthly subscription to fund your choice of different climate projects. REN supports a wide range of things like biochar in California that permanently stores carbon and prevents future wildfires, or other projects like planting trees in East Africa. You'll receive monthly updates on the projects that you support, see where your money is going, write down to photos and details of every tree planted. For me, I'm currently backing the California Fund because I have family and friends that live out in that area and I want to try to help with the wildfire situation. 
What I really like about Ren is that it's completely tailored to you, the way you live and what your goals are. We all have a carbon footprint and Ren can help you find ways to reduce that impact by changing banks, where you buy your groceries from, and by backing impactful projects. To learn more about how you can help to end the climate crisis, check out the link in the description, and the first 100 people who sign up will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. A special thanks to Ren and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to those nuclear power benefits for shipping. First, the power density of nuclear reactors is much higher than that of diesel engines, so you can travel for a longer period of time, even at higher speeds. Power density is the amount of power generated divided by the weight of the power system. Higher power density means a more compact power plant that can drive the ship farther. For example, the US Navy nuclear-powered Nimitz-class aircraft carrier can run for 20 years without refueling. And military submarines can run for months submerged without refueling. In comparison, submarines that are powered with diesel use batteries and only run underwater for a few days at low speeds, or as little as just a few hours at top speed. In addition, the higher power to weight ratio allows nuclear ships to sail longer ranges while carrying a heavier load. For example, compared to its diesel sibling, a nuclear powered aircraft carrier is able to take twice the volume of aircraft fuel, 30% more weapons, and 30,000 cubic feet of additional space due to the higher power density within a compact design. No space is taken up by fuel storage, air intakes, and exhaust trunks. Although nuclear power has a stigma around it from disasters like Chernobyl and Fukushima, nuclear power is still considered a very safe power source. Over the greater part of a century, the US Navy has run more than 6,200 reactor years and sailed more than 240 million miles without radioactive leakage or accidents. Similar to nuclear power plants, reactors used for marine propulsion also produce clean, renewable energy but they have several differences from land-based nuclear reactors. First, they're much smaller because in shipping, the limitations in volume and weight are higher. While a nuclear reactor of a conventional power plant can produce thousands of megawatts, reactors for marine propulsion have power ratings around a few hundred megawatts. Due to their smaller volume, nuclear reactors for shipping need to produce more power per cubic foot, increasing stress in mechanical components. Currently, the fuel in land-based reactors is less concentrated than in marine nuclear reactors. A highly enriched fuel results in a smaller core, silent operation, and long life service, but it's also more expensive and raises issues around nuclear proliferation. In the event of an accident, large areas of water could be contaminated with nuclear fuels, damaging both human and marine life. Just like in land-based power plants, the main risk of nuclear-powered ships lies in the condensation process. Similar to what happened in the Fukushima disaster, if the electrical power grid goes out, the high-temperature steam doesn't go back to the liquid state, overheating and increasing the system's pressure, leading to an explosion. And these power plants need to have several backup systems in order to keep the condensation system operational. Reactors for marine propulsion need to be extremely trustworthy and require little maintenance that has to be performed at port. Add to this the challenges around corrosion due to the salty seawater, the need for limited vibration, and other considerations. When it comes to the economics, the upfront costs for building and fueling a nuclear-powered ship are higher when compared to building a diesel-powered ship. However, after making the initial investment in nuclear, you don't have to worry about fuel costs for years. With the long times between refueling, nuclear ships are less prone to market volatility than diesel ships. If diesel costs rise in the future, the nuclear fuel savings could compensate for the higher upfront costs, in addition to releasing far less CO2 into the atmosphere. A study made by the Congressional Budget Office analyzed the cost effectiveness of nuclear propulsion for the US Navy. It considered an increased rate for oil prices per year of 1% above the rate of general inflation through 2040. The result was a total life cycle cost for the nuclear fleet 19% higher than a diesel fleet if oil prices continued to rise. Another analysis suggested that a fleet of nuclear-powered destroyers would become cost-effective if oil prices' rate of growth went over 3.4%. Developing a nuclear fleet would save 5 million barrels of oil annually, and as a consequence, avoid tons of carbon being released into the atmosphere. So how does this look for commercial use? In commercial shipping, nuclear's high power density could allow for bulk carriers which carry minerals, grains, and coal, as well as container ships carrying more cargo at higher speeds and traveling longer distances. Although nuclear-powered ships have been mostly used for military application, they have been used in commercial cargo ships. Russia, for example, dispatched the ship Sevmorput, a 61,000 deadweight tonnage nuclear-powered cargo ship, to help carry metal structures and equipment to Bangladesh. The Sevmore put started operating in 1988, but was retrofitted in 2015. A single KLT-40 nuclear reactor with a thermal output of 135 megawatts is used to propel the ship, and it can transport 20 and 40-foot containers with a total capacity of 1,328 20-foot equivalent units when operated as a box ship. The ship's captain said, the transport potential of our vessel is unique. 
we are capable of taking on board oversized and heavy cargo, which allows us to reduce the number of vessels involved in sea transportation. The UK-based Core Power has been developing engine room layouts and propulsion systems utilizing a Marine Molten Salt Reactor, or MMSR. This technology is basically a replication of the Molten Chloride Fast Reactor that's been developed by a collaboration between TerraPower, Core Power, and a few other companies. The MMSR is more efficient and compact than conventional reactor designs. In this reactor type, more than 95% of the energy in the fuel is harnessed, while in traditional reactors, it's around 1%. Over the course of 25 years, a capsized bulk carrier would consume less than 200 kilograms of fuel, running 2.7 million nautical miles without refueling, without polluting, and producing very little waste. From the economic viability perspective, the MMSR has some benefits versus diesel engines. In an interview for North, Mikkel Bo, CEO of Core Power, said diesel engines are cheap, but maintenance and fuel over the lifetime of the ship is expensive. On VLSFO, the total propulsion costs, including CapEx and OpEx, of a very large container ship can be more than $1.4 billion over a 30-year period, sailing at full service speed. The marine MSRs are fueled for life, so the initial cost is higher, but OpEx over the lifetime of the ship is very low. A 20,000 TEU container ship would be as much as 50% cheaper to run on full service speed with a marine MSR. When carbon taxes for fossil fuels are introduced, either through the carbon trading system or a global levy, the economic case for MSR technology becomes even greater. Regarding safety, an MSR uses liquid fuel, which rules out the possibility of a meltdown. Also, water isn't used in the process, so MSRs wouldn't form hydrogen, which reduces the risk of explosion. They also work at lower pressures than other nuclear reactors, further reducing the risk of an explosion. While the waste from a traditional nuclear reactor needs to be stored safely for about 10,000 years, the spent nuclear waste from an MSR would only need to be stored for about 300 years. South Korea is also investing in small modular reactors, which could be used for submarines. The project named Advanced Reactor for Multiple Applications has been developed by Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute, and the 70 megawatt output SMRs could be powering South Korea's next generation 4,000 ton submarines. The project is planned to be finished by 2027. They've also partnered with Samsung Heavy Industries, aiming to build vessels powered by molten salt reactors. The agreement includes a design of a small modular reactor based offshore nuclear product, its technology, performance verification, as well as the economic assessment and business model development. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any information about when the project will be completed. And while it's not directly related to nuclear-powered shipping, we did come across some other uses of SMRs for marine use that's worth bringing up. There's also plans floating around for offshore nuclear power plants, literally floating nuclear reactors. Prodigy Clean Energy from Canada has teamed up with NuScale, a leader in SMR technology, and Kinetrix in order to develop a marine power station. In the proposed project, 12 77 megawatt SMRs produced by NuScale would be installed in the power station, moored offshore, and then connected to the existing shoreside transmission system. The SMRs would be used to produce electricity, generate heat and clean fuels such as hydrogen and ammonia, as well as desalinate or treat water. Regarding timelines, we still don't have one for this project, but NuScale's first commercial SMR power plant is planned to start operating in 2029 in the US. And to sum up, there are several challenges that have to be overcome before cost-effective and safe nuclear reactors can be used to power commercial ships. The hurdles left to overcome encompass safety and technological issues, as well as regulatory and political issues. Although there are a few projects ongoing to decarbonize the shipping industry with nuclear power, and there are several benefits in doing it, it's still not clear about when, or even if, we'll be seeing commercial ships being powered by MSRs or SMRs. Political will and cost versus the benefits will drive the future of nuclear-powered commercial ships. So what do you think? Do you think nuclear for the shipping industry is a good idea? Jump in the comments and let me know. And thanks as always to my patrons. All of your direct support really helps with producing these videos, and it helps to reduce my dependence on the almighty YouTube algorithm. Speaking of which, if you like this video, check out one of the ones linked right here. And subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.